and the higher you go, the less people are involved. But in this process, what I think is sort of happening is that there is, you know, the, the administration, the upper administration today in this context of the corporate university are more and more sort of corporate minded leaders. Right? So they are not leaders so much as managers. Right? That's, that's sort of the notion. They could be leaders and so on, but it's if they can manage resources and create efficiency, that they are good for administrative positions. So, Already more and more, the higher administration is being sort of taken mainly by people who are well, already well oriented and have accepted uh, the, the demands of neoliberalism, the creed of neoliberalism. More efficiency, better organization, so on. So they enter in conflicts with the other layer below, who are the professors. Because the professors are there, you know, you're getting many cases very bad pay, you know, if you, wanted, if you were doing it for money, whatever you would be doing, you would be using your intelligence in another private sector and so on, so you are there for your dedication, for your passion, for your commitment to your discipline. And there comes these neoliberal figures to then cut your funding to teaching for research, uh, integrate these um, criteria of evaluation from the from business and the corporate world into you, and you say this doesn't translate. Right? There are all these fights between the, that layer of the professorship and the neoliberal layer and the neoliberal. But you see, that's fundamentally an opposition between a liberal and a neoliberal. Uh, that's a liberal neoliberal engagement. And I mean liberal in the way that I've been talking about liberal so far. So, but because you're being pressed by the upper administration as the neoliberals, you think that you're still, you, you have not only this consciousness, but this radiant, uh, you know, because you are the, the defender of the discipline. The discipline is the highest point, and the discipline cannot be sold, right? So you then, in that moment of heightened neoliberalism, your liberalism also heightens as the guardian of the discipline and knowledge. So when then the students come from below and they also challenge you, right they are, you are already in a position that you're not going to be moved. You are the loyal guardian of the liberal arts and sciences. There is no patience to deal with these fools. Just came here yesterday and now want to take over. Right? Where they don't know that you, if you should, should go first through all these stages, become disciplined, and help us to fight the neoliberals. And the students are for the most part saying, and pardon my English, fuck you, <laughs> we're going against your liberalism and simultaneously against that neoliberalism. And the, the fight that they are putting in front of us is a twofold struggle against neoliberalism, the neoliberalism was particularly the higher administration and the liberalism of the middle more ground. Now I would say that even, you know, in this in this sort of distribution, I mean some of the students of course are already well in they came to university because they have, they already bought into the neoliberal project in the first place. So right this is not like this won't be the majority of the students or anything. Particularly if you have a successful education through primary and secondary school, it means the success means that you already integrated neoliberal values and liberal values into it. So it's going to be a shock when you're trying to enter the university and these people are stuck it, are not letting me accept it. That is my individual right. I am paying for it and I need to go in. <laughs> so there are these, you know, so there is of course a trend that then connects the neoliberal, the liberal and the and but you see. I think that neoliberalism, because it has to do with efficiency and manage, you know, sometimes it's more flexible. Sometimes, not always. Sometimes it's more flexible than, 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 than this liberalism. Because at the end, you know, you don't want chaos and disorder, so what we will try to see, what do we need to do? It's a, nego you know, it's a negotiation, it's a power, what do we do? It's a practical issue. How do we create the, the liberal faculty? It's not a question of practice. Pra Praxis or practical issue is a question of principle. We are not going to negotiate. From this knowledge is too valuable. Our entire careers have been invested here. Right? 
and now you are telling me that I need to read another canon? I read Fanon 40 years ago. Yeah, I have it summarized in three lines. So what do I need to, right? That's typically the, the, the what do I, do I need to learn? You know. So I think that there is a more, um, actually maybe the, this is, I hadn't thought about this, but in the US elections these days, you know people, you know Trump is getting on, Trump is this sort of neoliberal guy, it's from the, coming from the business world. And there is Cruz, you know, uh, Ted Cruz, who is the hyper evangelical um, Tea Party. I sort of think, I mean, both are extremely dangerous. I have the feeling that Cruz may be even more dangerous than Trump. Because tr the Trumps of the world, you know, he's trying to, like he has said when, when the Israeli Palestinian, well, I go there neutral, I, 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 I break a deal. I, 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 come, I, I come pick. So you see, you're like this, it's efficiency, what, you know, it's efficiency that these super races at the same time committed with the well-being of only a sector of the population, but with enough opposition, you can see him turning sides in some ways. I, I think, at least to some respect, with Cruz, is the commitment, is the conviction that he's the defender of that order, raising order. So I see him much more, much more, less flexible. He is like the liberals in the academy. He is like the crews, the pro uh, professors, <laughs> you know, the faculty, all the faculty were the cruises of the university. And we're fighting against the trumps of the university. And we're mad. How can these fools be t having so much power and dictating to us what to do? But it's an intra-racist and racial and intra-colonial struggle. And what the students are doing, and what is unforgivable about what they are doing, is that they are exposing both. And they are asking for that. And doing that, they are coming not only with you know, this, this intervention, but also a new, a, a new sort of body of work that they are addressing, knowledge, readings. Many of these students are not only extremely smart, but I mean, they are reading more of outside of the classes about things that inform their struggles than in the classes themselves. So they're already producing by themselves. They're not counting on the university to give them too much. Right? They're already doing it. And I think that that's, that goes towards the, the other part of, of this that I won't be able to present today, then is the, the, about that canon, that counter canon, that counter vision that is being formulated. So I wanted to talk about black consciousness and the black consciousness, when students mobilize black consciousness, again, from the liberal standpoint, is there again you are re-racializing relations. But I think that the, the black consciousness is, as I said, you know, in the in the paragraph describing the talk, it's a gift. But it's, it's a gift that is a venom at the same time, it's a gift of death to lead liberalism and neoliberalism. And therefore, the liberals and neoliberals, it smells it, they know, and anything they, they will do anything but take a little bit of that medicine. So I have a theorization of that, of the gift is connected with the colonial love and with loving and with a different temporality, the temporality, speciality, and subjectivity of love and gift, gift giving. But uh, maybe what I'll do is since that part of that part of it is based on my reading of Fanon, then maybe tomorrow in the in the in CISA I can I can talk a little bit about that, and then there will be a continuity with tomorrow. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Nelson is very invested in the capitalist logic of the television serial because he's left us with a hook. He promised us the gift of black consciousness, but he says not today, tomorrow. So I hope all of you will turn up uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock at the Center for Indian Studies. You're also doing a lecture at UJ, right? That's today. Yeah, that's tonight. Yeah. Tonight at uh, but the venue. I think 6.30 p.m. or something like that. Yeah, 6.30 p.m. So there's a whole range of conversations that, are, uh, that will be going on. And as you will notice, while the talk was going on, the swap banner did not fall, but it got slightly a slant. And, and, and indeed, that, and that, that is what we might be negotiating towards at WITS you know, as well. But I'll briefly uh, put forward three points. And uh, uh, you know, what I take away from this, because uh, Nelson is from Puerto Rico. I come from India. Most of you are South African here. But when he talks, there is a resonance for all of us from the landscapes of 
inequality, hierarchy, exclusion that we all inhabit and come from. So when he asked that poignant question, is apartheid over? In what ways is it over? For whom is it over? Coming from India, I think about caste. And I think is the caste hierarchy over? Because every day uh, there are Dalits, untouchables, who are being hung on trees, who are being killed. And while there is an uh, enormity of laws that is supposed to prevent atrocities of this kind, it continues to happen. And three months ago, two months ago, in the university uh, uh, down south where I used to teach, a former uh, a student, a Dalit untouchable student, committed suicide. And that was the only outlet that he had for the rage directed against the university, to go back to the question that Nelson Ray, uh, raised. Uh, as, what is the emotion that should be dominant in a university? Is it calm, cool reason? Or is it going to be rage? Is it going to be passion? And what is, and how, what is that going to do to our understanding of pedagogy? The first, I mean, I think with regard to apartheid, you also raised the question of it. Now, now it's no longer necessary to have past laws. It's no longer necessary to have curfews. It's no longer necessary to shoot people because people have internalized. And the university becomes the space through which we reproduce those structures of power, the hierarchy, the collusion. The university invites us to collude and teaches us to collude and puts us in a space where we can become the ideal citizens of the neoliberal order. And I think this is the danger that Nelson is pointing to. And where questions of what is the canon, questions of merit in the university, no candidates of sufficient merit has been found, have been found. This is the argument that rules the Indian university, and this is the argument that came from another university on the coast, which said that it takes 20 years to prepare somebody to make them professors, and so on, this question of merit. What is this university that we are burnishing, this golden calf that we worship, right? where this is supposedly the space of excellence and we look around at each other and at ourselves and say, do we embody that kind of unreachable excellence? Are we truly the spirits that are going to guide the future? And finally, I think this question that he raised, which I think of neoliberalism, perhaps you could gloss it in many ways, because central to the question of the university is the question of debt. Right? Because it is not through knowledge alone that students are into that reproduction. It is through debt. In America, the extent to student debt is well over a trillion dollars right now. So the amount that students are indebted to that capitalist order is the amount that America has spent on the Middle Eastern war over 10 years. So similarly, when we think about questions like peace must fall, the fact that more and more students are getting into debt to repay student loans, what happens when you are in debt? When you are indebted to the very system with which you, know, which you are required to fight against and think against. So there's a whole question of not only neoliberalism, but the present stage of financial capitalism, where our debts are the commodity on which capitalism rests. Right, so I think there are many larger questions, but I will stop here and we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, Kelly. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk, um, I wanted just to um, open up this question of liberalism a little bit more because I think there's something very, very useful, very useful for us having you diagnose liberalism as a site of uh, kind of political life of the institution and of the, of the society. Um, but I think to, to complicate what liberalism is, I think would be helpful. What you gave us in this talk was that liberalism is primarily a kind of order of in individuality um, that ignores the past. But I think we have... Um, I think we have in this country, in the history of politics in this country, a different conversation about liberalism that points in a range of different directions. For example, I'm thinking about the, um, this key moment in black consciousness when, when people rejects not liberalism but white liberals. And he does it for a very specific reason. It's because the capacity to generate a kind of 
um, uh, creative and resistant that subjectivity cannot happen in the presence of, of um, white do-gooders. Right? So there's a kind of, um, there's an element of white sympathy or white um, curiosity or white um, well-meaningness that, that I think liberalism also holds here. And, and critically, he put white, whiteness with liberalism in a way that I think um, was really important in the conceptualization of what liberalism means in this context. Um, and that was, in a sense, both productive of and in response to a kind of way in which um, a kind of Marxist-Leninism in this context had framed li liberalism as being useful but not nearly good enough. So I think there's a, there's a sense that uh, these two different traditions both are critical of li liberalism but critical of liberalism in different kinds of ways. And I think for me there's something about um, the way in which you draw a line between liberalism and fascism or show them as a kind of Janus, as this Janus case that really rejects the way in which a lot of uh, Marxists have read liberalism. And I think, I think there's something about that that provides a clue to what de decolonization or decoloniality might be about, that I think is difficult for, for, for us to grasp, but probably the black consciousness tradition in South Africa got closest to, to formulating in terms of what, how, how to define liberalism. But, but it, it wasn't defined in relation to fascism, perhaps. I mean, maybe I'm misreading that. But it seemed to be in relationship to a kind of uh, misplaced willingness of whites to try and interfere or to try and be allies in a way that was completely inappropriate to the work that needed to be done in the context of, of ending the party. So, to, to, to maybe to ask you to think, to think with us more broadly about in this context what, liberal, what, what the tenets of liberalism might look like or might mean and how, how, how we might be able to configure this system. Well, yeah. Comments also don't have, I mean, we can make it in the conversation. There are not a lot of us here, so don't think that is a silly question. Um, I should have three questions. Yeah, you won't get an answer to all of them, but it's <laughs> uh, So the first question is around this idea of access and, and pain and death that we brought up. And it's basically, you know, I'm just curious whether you have a theory as to why there isn't a big peace must fall movement in the US, considering the extent of um, My second question is, and maybe you're speaking to this more tomorrow, but if you could just very briefly talk about your vision of what liberalism should be replaced with. Um, and my third question, it's hard to put it politely, but uh, it's around co-option and collaboration versus subversion. And basically I'm curious as to why so many intellectuals from the South or from the third world, if you wish, end up in the US and in U.S. institutions, or U.K. institutions. And uh, what that says about the material power differences um, that exist between institutions in the South and in the North, and the ability of these institutions in the North to collapse. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, so, yeah, we So, yeah, yeah, we wanted to have this other angle of, of the question. Like, uh, the, the idea of feeling uh, that apartheid if we go back tomorrow, people, my white people to be done with it. So, yeah, but with the situation around the country, uh, why would we presume that even the Guptas would? Acronym as give us the passport to Australia as the situation is yeah uh, very current. So yeah, the ecology, the ecology of the colonial, the colonial, colonial, 
we would like to ask the special configuration of the setups of, of yeah, the unemployment. Fees must fall basically if people are going to be indebted and blacklisted uh, at the end of their graduation uh, courses and uh, there's no employment. So, yeah, so where are they supposed to, 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 to write back to? Yeah. So, yeah, that hack of the government. Yeah, there's maybe some question will come up. I must put it out there, I was offered the post of Vice Chancellor by the Guptas, but I said no. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, debt, this is this is key in the in the U.S. I mean, and that's the big question in the U.S. When and some people are trying to mobilize uh, uh, and challenge the government and so on because it has become so. And the government, minimally within the you know horizon of liberalism and capitalism, is trying to be trying to respond in some way because it's become so obviously unacceptable and brutal. Right? It's become over. So in a way, when I, um, you know, Huthi Wilson did more theorizes about debt peonage. Right? So you can have become a peon of the system through that and so on. What I am, but you know, to get to, 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 to debt, obviously if you are very rich, you are not going to get to debt, right? And uh, if you are um, <coughs> poor, you could, but actually, it seems that most of the ones going into that are the ones cut more or less in, 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 in the middle uh, because they are expected to pay everything and then the parents, on the basis of what the parents earn and what they will earn for the rest of their lives and what they, the students will survive. Right, so that's the calculation. So it is, it is fatal, particularly for, for that sector. So but I, what I was trying to do here is to say that even if there was no debt trap in that way, right? That already the fact of making education into something that you pay for, right? That already the, the main spirit converting you, right? It's, it's already there. What we find in the US is like one part of the, the excess <laughs> to some extent of that very logic. 
So that it, I'm not sure how, probably South Africa is not as great as in the US what it is, you know, it's really, really big. Or in sense, even if, you know, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, not nearly as. Because if not, you can have people, well, you see, in the US, this is what students go through. Here in comparison, we're well in comparison. And I think that the students are saying is, you know, we don't care about that. You know, we don't care whether here we have less debt and then we have more debt. In principle, particularly in a highly segregated society, you're not going to make the institution, the premier institution for social mobility, and make it into yet another type of passage through the socialization of capitalism and neoliberalism. I we really want to make solid change. We need to create a, you know, really make a different kind of institution right there. So I, I agree completely with the question of, of the issue, but at, at the same time, I think that uh, even without, um, even if we, the government would get, would get to solve the problem of debt, we still have uh, a fundamental issue with the, with the economy. And these are the kinds of issues that I think uh, that, yeah, traditionally, it has been, you know, Marxist, from Marxist perspective, you know, the diet, the, the, the triad is like Immanuel Wallerstein wrote that the three main ideologies of modernity are conservatism, liberalism, and so Marxism. With three different temporalities, three different ideas of intervention, and so on. And typically, what we see is sort of the tension between these three conservatives and liberalism and Marxism. So, what I'm trying is to read liberalism out of that internal intra European dialectic and intra modern dialectic. What it is when it's read from the, say, the, the, the body of the of the, the, the condemned. Right? condemn the human eyes um, out of modernity, you know, in the sun of that nation. And when look at from that body, conservatism, Marxism, and liberalism do not look so different to fascism in some ways. So what I'm trying is to explore a little bit about that optic. From that optic, how does then liberalism look at? So, I am aware that there have been other readings of liberalism, particularly from the Marxist, advocating collectivity, for example, uh, change of the structures and so on. I could do my own reading, critical reading of Marxism, right? but it is not the dominant. It's not like Marxism is oppressing us all in this current order. And so, you sort of, my, and, and it's not like the university is behaving, right? According to this Marxist, this socialist way. So I think that's why then I'm sort of targeting that I'm bringing this other box. Because I think that when I try to understand what the students are bringing up to the scene, I think it's a different optic that has not been that way before. So, of course, this needs to be, I mean, this is a short lecture and so on, this needs to be developed in so many ways. But I will still um, emphasize the importance of elaborating that, that perspective. Um, and also of locating, uh, you know, that they elected like between Marxism. Not that there have not been Marxism of people of color. Not that Marxism have been taken up, you know, and taken up in other directions. Uh, but uh, in the current day, I think that what the students are bringing is not so. It's not only a, a, when they call it for decolonization. It's not simply for you know a, a, a slightly mutated Marxism. It's a, it's a different. So I'm trying to develop that a little bit. Um, this most form in the US, replacing liberalism with what, you know, in the US, again, there, have been, there is some kind of movement, but I think in the US, um, this adjustment started in the 60s. What we're seeing now is you know, a shift that has been going for, for quite some time. So, um, and funny enough, you know, Reagan in California, when he was governor of California uh, in the 60s, um, he took a pivotal role as part of the Republican Party. And a, pres I mean, a governor in the state with the most elite public university system in the whole United States. So what he did there, and what the, you know, the Republican view of education and so on, what happened in California was key for what then began to happen in the rest of the, of the country, I think, around public education. 
And he began, he came out publicly saying like, you know, in, you know, in the 60s, when then the campuses were becoming, particularly public universities, but not only places of contestation and so on. At that moment when the universities, particularly from the students, are taking the universities to defy the logic, they say, well, you know, that, that's the moment where it gets to be the privatization gets, the, so maybe why should the state be paying these classes? And there were classes, some of the classes were on like organizing, you know, which I think should be like that, you know, should be, I think that now when people criticize the students, they are doing this, they didn't organize, I say, well, why not open classes for organizing? So that they can study all kinds of organizing, so that, you know, the university can actually facilitate that process. Uh, Change management. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, but, but the idea is that, that, you know, it was in that context. It, it was two things happening. The universities were becoming this side of contestation on the one hand, and on the other hand, a population that had not been, you know, the universities were desegregated, started to be desegregated in like 1955. This is the 60s. So really that young people entering the public institutions. So once those people come into the institutions, and once the institutions become sites of revolt, the state doesn't see any need to keep paying, facilitating the education of people. So they begin to privatize. So that, that is to say, there is already an internal process inside the university in its own commitment with its racist liberalism to lead to the neoliberal reality that it later found. The neoliberal reality of the late is not simply imposed from outside to this innocent liberal university. Right? What I'm saying is that the model has been there in cultivation for a number, number, number of years. And people have got, you know, people are already used, you know, okay, you pay for it. You, so that idea is very still in the world. So I think that, in a way, has partly prevented that. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it hasn't been challenged to, 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 to institute. Um, and I think it has to do also with the overall U.S. society already accustomed to a particular form of, of, of capitalism and so um, Liberalism with what? I don't think that, you know, unless, I don't want to find, I want to say, well, so we're talking about decoloniality. I would like to think that somehow decolonization has to do with it. But you see decolonization, the thing is that it's not an ideology that indicates an end, it's a process. So I think that the question is, participate in the process to de really desegregate and decolonize society. And we together in that process are going to engineer new visions of what the, to the tomorrow should be, what structure, how, and where, right? We'll, we'll, we'll be different in India, we'll be different here, we'll be different in different places. So I don't think, you know, that the trick should be into, into naming something specific that will replace it but to identify the major components of those major ideologies and structures and then critically analyze them and produce other views. So that's the other part which has to do about the gift of black consciousness. Then I talked about the new views of subjectivity, the new views of temporality, the new of space. So if we begin to organize across those different forms of temporality and speciality, we can develop together a vision. Right? And that's why I think it's in immense bad faith when people ask the students, well, okay, you complain, but what do you propose now? Right? Because what you're waiting is that for the other, that other idea, if I don't come with this recipe, with this image of the future, then it's not, it's not valid. But it's completely misunderstanding everything, everything. Um, and it's of bad faith also, because the idea is that you really don't understand what the challenge, but you want to go to the next step. So that, of course, when anyone says anything about tomorrow, what it should be like that, what it should be, you will find an exception of some kind. And then you shoot down the, the position and also the diagnosis of the problem. So I think that, that generally speaking, I am very nervous with, with the, the expectation. Not that I am feeling this in, into you, but I think that that's it was more general. Uh, intellectuals from the south and the north, this dynamic. I mean, one, one reading of it is very, is very, one reading of it is very obvious. Let's not think about critical intellectuals or anything, right? Let's think about, just study. Because northern universities, first European universities, French, you know, Spanish, uh, uh, German, uh, you know, they had this order of prestige. And the states were invested in educating the population, right? Heavily invested. And it was a monolithic 
more or less you know, completely monolithic, but far, far le less diverse than the US and these other territories. So they were not anxious about